Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure as co-president of YPRONES and together with my uh, colleague Rosalind Dixon to welcome you for this event. We are very happy to have this uh, discussion of a book by, by Tina Tsuvala. I I'm also very happy that we are discussing a book on international law because uh, when uh, the society uh, was, uh, was founded, and it's the International Society of Public Law, of course, there was discussion about the multidisciplinarity and the uh, attempt to involve uh, the widest possible range of uh, scholars. And uh, uh, I must say that administrative law on the one hand and international law on the other hand uh, were uh, probably at the beginning not so uh, involved as we wanted because there was a, a, a natural predominance of constitution. So constitutional law and constitutional lawyers. So progressively something that we experienced at our, um, at our annual congresses and conferences and also the event is to uh, demonstrate the importance of have this constant dialogue between uh, all uh, the branches of public law where international law is, of course, one of the most uh, significant. So uh, it's a particular joy to have a discussion of such an important book. Uh, so welcome again. And now I'm happy to give the floor to Roberto Niembro. Uh, thank you, Loren Lorenzo. It's, I'm happy to be here also. Uh, I, I will explain the methodology to everybody, and, and then I will, we will begin with the presentation. Each discussant will have 10 minutes maximum to deliver their comments. Uh, I have to be strict, so I will send you a message maybe two minutes before you finish. Then we will have uh, around 40 or 45 minutes for Q&A. Please uh, send your questions in the chat. Uh, don't, uh, don't be shy. And or you raise your hand when we finish, but you can begin sending your questions when we are presenting our, or uh, Dina is making their comments. Uh, I want to, re record, uh, to remember you that the presentation is going to be recorded. So if you don't want, please turn off your video and uh, send me your question and I can read them in, uh, later on. Uh, and I'm gonna present the, the person that are gonna make the comments. First, Tansil Chowdhury uh, from Queen Mary University of London, UK. Yeah, also from Melbourne Law School in Australia. Uh, Matthias Kuhn from, uh, from WCB Berlin, Germany and NYU School of Law. And at the end, uh, Lina is gonna make some comments and replies. So uh, you have the floor for 10 minutes, please. Uh, Tansil, you can begin. Thank you, uh, Roberto, and thanks to Iconess and the organisers for the invitation. Uh, not only is it a pleasure to share the panel with the esteemed colleagues, but also, of course, to offer them my very modest reflections on the work of such a brilliant thinker such as Dina, whose writings are not only, to, to paraphrase the old Marx adage, about understanding the world, but also trying to change it, but who herself is such a generous scholar who has offered much of her time and support to others. So to summarise the key claims of the book, Dina uh, effectively responds to one of the critical legal studies critiques of Marxist legal theory, proffered by the likes of Kennedy and Tushnet, by marrying what I think is an irrefutable element of legal reasoning, indeterminacy with social structures, the text to the material, as she writes. Departing from the kind of illusory, illusory semantic stability of legal language, she describes the oscillatory indeterminacy of one albeit prominent uh, form of legal argumentation, the standard of civilization upon which degrees of international legal personality are predicated in accordance with their conformity or utility with the tenets of capitalist modernity. The antinomous poles of this indeterminacy swing between positions of non-inclusion based on a biological immutability and possible inclusion based on a Rostowian logic of capitalist improvement. But unlike some of the CLSs, Dina argues that these are contained indeterminacies with possibilities of variations only within the context of capital imperialism between a process of de-development or the generalization of the commodity form across the globe. So I'm a public lawyer rather than an international lawyer and one who's dipping their toes in this wide ocean 
uh, that is Lauren Markson. And therefore, I want to very tentatively explore two ways in which this book might speak to public lawyers and those working at the intersection of law and Marxism. Now, the very first um, tenuous point, and I, I emphasize tenuous, uh, that I want to make is how we might use Dina's writing on the standard of civilization and its various rearticulations to understand the process of juridification and capitalism, particularly in post-colonial states and constitution making. So James Tully, in his paper, Modern Constitutional Democracy and Imperialism, writes that, quote, the right of the self-proclaimed civilized imperial powers to extend colonial and international modern constitutional regimes around the world correlated with the sacred duty to civilize the indigenous people under their rule. The civilizing duty involves, first and foremost, imposing the civilizing Western laws over indigenous legal order, disposing, marginalizing, or transforming their customary forms of cooperative ownership, work and governance, and introducing capitalist corporations, foreign investment, labor discipline, modern contractual relationships, and a territorially based colonial political order. The second dimension, Tully continues, in transplanting the modern constitutional form was to apply colonial governmentality in detail to shape and form their forms of subjectivity so that they would assume civilized forms of self-government in stages and acquire the competitive individualism of a modern foreign controlled capitalist economy in a global system led by the developed states. Now, one of the very interesting points about many post-colonial states is that they almost all had written constitutions and constitutional courts. Now, I'm gonna ask you that you allow me to make this very loaded claim, and that is to equate written constitutions and the existence of constitutional courts with juridification, which I, I very simply summarize as a colonization of politics with law and ju judicial institutions and all the permutations which juridification brings with it, which I think uh, Rob Knox summarizes really, really well in the opening paragraphs uh, of his essay on law austerity. In a book I've just finished reviewing, uh, Constitutional Idolatry by Brian Christopher Jones, in one of the chapters, he carries out this corpus in historical analysis of the term constitutional guardians, which he generally concludes appears more frequently in states with written constitutions and constitutional courts. Now, when I read that, I equated constitutional guardianship as a common argumentation for increasing juridification. In particular, what guardianship reminded me of was Dina's work, that juridification as guardianship, as it were, was a rearticulation of the standard of civilization, that certain racialized peoples were not capable of exercising popular democratic control of their state institutions at independence, and that this had to be left to elites in judiciary through things like constitutional review. But drawing from Tully and Dina, this was not just about the transplantation of Western forms of juridified constitutionalism, but to capture and reproduce the capitalist value form. So I'm gonna offer a very loosely put together hypothesis, especially someone who still has much to learn about post-colonial constitution making. And the argument goes like this. I like to propose that juridification as a constitutional form, especially in the post-colonial context of constitutional uh, uh, making, was another rearticulation of the standard of civilization, sometimes referred to as guardianship, but perhaps not, but not necessarily vesting power in an imperial metropole, metropolitan state, but an imperial form of juridified constitutionalism that insulated post-colonial states from popular political power and threats to capital. Again, borrowing from Dina, we must read juridification as a form of post-colonial constitution making within its material context. This process of juridification, of course, is not a process of rational progressivism. Indeed, as my colleague, uh, Evan Anopoulos writes, a mere diagnosis of a shift to law tells us nothing about the cause, effects, or desirability of juridification. Tully, for example, ties the imperialism of the constitutional form to the generalization and capture of capitalism. So what might juridification with guardianship as a prominent form, of it, form part of its argumentation say about the production and capture of, the cap, of capital's value in post-colonial constitution making? And I think Dina's book would help us public lawyers answer that question. The second reflection I want to make on Dina's work is how she theorizes the work of international law and capital. And so here I'm concerned with what um, Marxist legal scholarship might say about capitalist law as opposed to other legal orders of other social relations, slavery, tributary systems, feudalism, et cetera, et cetera. What is the relationality between law and capitalism qua, uh, as an economic relation? 
Um, and so I'm going to kind of go back to basics, forgive me, and borrow very generously from the critical summaries offered by uh, the likes of Nate Holden, Eric uh, Tucker and others to classify some of the strands of Marxist legal thought in an attempt to locate Dina's theorization of law and capital and what I think it does differently. So we might divide Marxist legal theory into the following. There is, of course, the uh, economist or reductionist view, often captured by the base superstructure metaphor, um, where legal superstructures are merely an epiphenomenal reflection of the economic base. And, and, and this kind of betrays a dialectical understanding of law as an element in a totality of complex interactions and contradictions. Um, so to kind of use the authorizarian uh, position, it recognizes the, the relative autonomy of law and rejects this kind of expressive or transitive causality between the economic base and law. Uh, related to this kind of base superstructure school is also the kind of instrumentalist view that sees law as consciously chosen to serve the interest of an identifiable business elite. We might also conceive of law and legal orders role in capital accumulation as ideological. So coercion or extra economic forces, Marx might call it, cannot alone sustain capitalist social formation. So as Gramsci writes, a society's population needed to be convinced of an economic order's legitimacy, what he refers to as a common sense. So law and ideological domination was partly achieved, this holding and Tucker right, through law's valorization of formal equality and freedom, abstracted from the reality of unequal social relations. And Susan Marx's writings on ideology are particularly instructive of this. The other line of Marxist legal theory is the commodity form theory of law, popularized by Pashukhanis, which concerns itself not with the content, but with the form of law. So the best way to illustrate this is to compare uh, capitalist legalities to other non-capitalist legalities. The regulation, the capitalist legal form is the regulation of social relations, which assumes a legal character and mirrors the commodity form of, uh, of exchange, a homology to use uh, Balbus's writing. And finally, we might also think of law and legal orders as constitutive of the capitalist social totality. So this writing is uh, attributed to the likes of Clare and others. And relatedly, Chris Tomlin's historicized and rendered contingent laws qualitative being socially constitutive um, and kind of departs from the CLS claim of legal indeterminacy, affirming legal orders as determining indeed dominating, uh, dominating social force. So these are some of the ways in which Marxist or lawyers have conceptualized the relationship between law and capital, but this is by no means exhaustive. So how exactly does Dina conceptualize the relationship between the two? That is my main quest question to Dina. Without going into too much detail, she clearly rejects a Pashukhanite commodity the uh, theory of uh, uh, form of law. Uh, and I think those reasons are very convincing. But interestingly, Dina discusses the operative role of law as constitutive, but also as ideological and historical. So pages 24 and 25, she sets out the law as constitutive of capitalist imperialism, but there is also a commitment on pages 22 to the ideological work the law does as obfuscating the exploitive relationships of capital. But there's also a commitment to the relative autonomy thesis, which is denoted by the Althusserian register of her work as well as a capture of her indeterminacy. And finally, of course, the work is deeply historical, or should I say historically materialist. And so my final comment is my reading of Dina's work in conceptualizing the work of law and capital is that we can't say it's economistic or commodity theory or instrumentalist or constitutive or ideological. And this is something that I've been trying to think through for a while. Dina's book appears to say to me that law's work in capital can do a few of the things at once. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's your turn, Fabia. You have uh, 10 minutes to the floor, please. OK. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this panel today. Um, I worked with Dina in Melbourne, so I'm happy to celebrate uh, the launch of your book. Uh, we all know the struggles that are involved in, in writing and I had the chance to see them. So um, I'm genuinely happy to, to be here. Um, so Tanzil did a great job in summarizing lots of things before me, so I can go straight to, to my questions and my thoughts. Uh, needless to say that this is a this is, um, very instigating book, a very instigating piece of scholarship. I think um, we, have, we have been having so many panels and book reviews, Dina, so many things have been written, so uh, this is um, 
this shows the reach of, of, of the arguments put in capitalism as a civilization. So to start with, I would like to comment that I, I really enjoy reading and seeing that your cards are pretty much on the table, clearly to the reader. So um, I'm not a Marxist, and this is important to situate my own stance in reading uh, Dina's work. Um, but of course, I'm interested in critical work and, and in general and, and in Dina's uh, work. So I, I really, uh, I find it very important to have a clear stance on, on your Marxist take in international law, avoiding all uh, reductionisms that we have seen before. Your book has lots of cautionary observations about this, um, some kind of use, uh, kind of common critique to Marxism in terms of determinism and how law is a mere um, product of uh, the infrastructure in a way. So I think you're very, you try uh, genuinely hard to, to kind of move the debate out of that commonsensical understanding of Marxism, offering us your symptomatic reading and how you're aiming to produce a pattern of uh, international legal argumentation. So you are uh, pretty much clear on that, and I think this is this is uh, good in international league, legal scholarship in general. Um, but then I I wanted to 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 raise a few thoughts and exchange a few a few reactions with with you, Dina, and um, I would start with your take on structure. And then I would like to ask you to tell us a bit more how you see um, the method of capitalism as civilization and the politics of the book. So that's how I will proceed in my, in my minutes here. Um, so you're very, as I was saying, you're very cautious about telling the reader that um, you are not discovering or aiming to reveal the truth about um, this uh, way of dealing with um, civilization. So um, going with an Althusserian approach, you are um, doing your symptomatic reading and, and producing very, really what you understand by this pattern of argumentation in international law. Despite all your caution and very detailed and rigorous analysis and the way you show the reader uh, your, your production of a, of a pattern in international law, I still have the feeling that in reading the book, you are offering us some kind of truth claim about the world in, 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 in this way. No? You're telling us that throughout time and space, different moments and different contexts. And, and I'm, I, I do not intend here to correct your stories. This is not what this book is about. And it's a possible historical approach. So there's no sense for us in trying to complete or to correct what you're telling us. The four chapters are super substantive, rigorous, and everything that everyone has already said. They really help us to think through your uh, main argument and also your attempts to reconcile, as Tanzil has already said, deconstruction with historical materialism. But then you are telling us, look, people, uh, dealing with um, civilization, engaging with this pattern of argumentation in, in international law has uh, proved to be a very dangerous endeavor. And uh, we have seen that uh, this is actually a very problematic um, engagement. So there is no real change of this structural pattern of argumentation, but lots of uh, problems when people have tried to somehow oppose or at least try to. So don't try to do it. That's, that's what I more or less take from, from the book. And you are, so, so it feels like a kind of truth claim about the work of international law in the world. And this is my main issue with, with the structure. So I really wanted to hear from you with um, how exactly this, the production of this pattern of argumentation helps us to understand international law as a whole, as you say you're in, your in your introduction, despite the fact that at the end of the book, you say that your approach is more of a finite theoretical framework to understand 
uh, and, and we might be open to new research in terms of new patterns to be produced by yourself or other people in, 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 international, in the field of international law. But I, I wanted to hear from you, what, what do we gain for, from adopting a structural approach uh, in the way you do in, in international law? And this has to do, Dina, actually with a um, bigger question, and now that's what I, I really, really wanted to hear from you about the politics of the book. Um, and, and here I will um, use Tony Angi's uh, review on Samuel, Mo Samuel Moyne's Last Utopia, the review that he published in Qui Parle in 2015, I think, um, just to help me to illustrate my, my point about you giving us a certain understanding about how international law operates in terms of its uh, pattern, in, term in terms of a very important part pattern of argumentation and the impact of your theoretical framework in the world. So Tony says that um, it's in a way, um, in a way, okay, this is my reading of him, so I'm not putting words in his mouth, but in a way it's very easy for a, someone as Samuel Moy to just say that human rights is the last utopia. So Tony asks last utopia for whom? And uh, how can, a scholar that is based in the US talking about lots of US uh, themes in his book, somehow play with a kind of generalizing language in the book, trying to deal with the whole world. And now I, re I reach the uh, most serious, the, the serious point of, of Tony's um, review. How can you take away a certain vocabulary from the oppressed of the world to articulate their own utopias? So what I wanted to hear from you is precisely that. If you're telling us that somehow civilization is the core tenet of international law, it's a sort of argumentative pattern that even though it's not the only one, it's a very important one. And you end your book with a call for action for us to think together, everything is at stake. I'm totally at, with you. The emergency of the situation is, is really um, de demands us to actually take action. But you are, we have to take action according to your problematic and the way that you produce this pattern of, of legal argumentation. And thinking of um, the oppressed in the peripheries of, of the world, uh, you are saying, look, there's no use in, you in, there's no use in articulating this, uh, this kind of vocabulary anymore in the way that Samuel Moy is talking about the vocabulary of human rights. So just to illustrate Dina, right here, right now in Brazil, and I, I thank Bruno uh, Pegorari for the exchange on these ideas, indigenous peoples have not much left under this horrific government. And all they are doing is, uh, and they are doing a lot based on the human rights vocabulary. The vocabulary of, um, uh, as you say, inclusion under a, a condition, right? It's, it's the case, uh, it's a very illustrative case. So how can we think of the politics of capitalism as civilization with your very robust and persuasive account of a certain pattern of uh, arguments in international law, your call for action at, at the end of the book, but a very, uh, a kind of, um, calling us also to abandon certain ways of dealing with political struggles through the vocabulary of international law. Can we do this to the oppressed? Can we do this for those who are struggling right here and right now in the peripheries of, of the world? So would love to hear from you. Thank you. And also thank you for ICOM from, for having me. This is a super productive conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Fabia. Uh... It's please go ahead. Thank you. Hi. It's it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure because um, this because reading this book um, carefully um, was um, a pleasure of sorts, um, and um, I'll 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 give you a more concrete idea of, of what I mean by that. First. This is a book with a wonderfully ambitious, uh, with wonderfully ambitious scope, 
um, it deals with the history of international law, basically from the late 19th century to the present. Um, that means it's a work which in some sense is the opposite of the increasing tendencies of historians to uh, focus on minutia um, uh, or very specific local uh, things without then trying to ask how it really fits into the larger um, history, the larger patterns of international law. So it's wonderfully ambitious uh, in its scope. Um, it has a clearly stated thesis. Um, 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 so its thesis is there is a certain pattern of argumentation uh, which uh, is referred to as standard of civilization, um, which basically has the function to arrange rights and obligations between different actors in an asymmetric, asymmetrical way. Uh, and this pattern of argumentation um, arranges asymmetries, establishes hierarchies in a way that oscillates between, on the one hand, um, an account which explains why these hierarchies are perpetual. So there is some kind of, uh, this is the logic of biology. There is an essentialist account as to why these hierarchies have to exist. And on the other hand, um, it's subjected to logic of improvement. So the idea is these hierarchies are only temporal. Uh, there is a way um, how through development and how through progress, uh, it might change and full equality might one day uh, be attained. Um, but the point is, the, the pattern of argumentation that's referred to as the standard of civilization uh, in, remains constant, uh, even as the specific doctrines uh, through which it operates um, uh, uh, vary. And, and secondly, um, the claim is that um, this constancy uh, of hierarchy um, uh, is ultimately to be understood as a function of the requirements of capitalist modernization. So the driver uh, or the enabler um, uh, uh, of uh, this types of uh, dynamic is to be grounded in, in, in how um, uh, modern capitalism uh, works and what its requirements are. So that's the, that's the classical Marxist uh, part. So it's a, um, so th there is this, uh, okay, now I'll just uh, leave it at that. But uh, to, be, to, to, be, to clarify, um, the core claim therefore is that there is a basic continuity. What is, uh, there's a basic continuity within international law uh, in that it insists on establishing uh, asymmetries, hierarchies between different uh, actors. Um, and that, it, and that these hierarchies are ultimately justified with regard to um, uh, modern capitalism. And that basically the, the starting point, of course, of this book is the late 19th century, a high point of colonialism, of European colonialism. The whole world was in some ways part of the European uh, colonial project. Um, and so the, the, the implicit claim is um, that notwithstanding uh, mainstream progress narratives to the contrary, um, uh, there's basic continuity in that regard. So the structure, the argumentative pattern uh, that um, uh, Tina uh, focuses on is one that is at the heart, uh, and I think plausibly at the heart, um, of a, an empire-oriented colonial uh, 19th century uh, international law. Um, so th it's wonderful to have a clearly articulated grand thesis uh, like, like this, because it, it requires you to think, it kind of initiates productive thinking I th um, uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, and the great thing about a book such as this is that it will even have significant value and be intellectually productive if it turns out that its core thesis is wrong. Uh, and I believe that its core thesis is wrong. Um, so how... So how does it? How does it? According to my own assessment, um, um, what makes it? What makes it unconvincing? First, with regard to the patterns of argumentation that are referred to as standard of civilization, and this, 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 um, this, this oscillation between the logic of biology and the logic of improvement. Um, I think, even if we just focus on the 
specific stories and cases uh, that Tina focuses on. And they are well chosen in the sense that they come from very different periods in the history of international. So there's a 19th century, uh, so there's a short, there's a chapter on the late 19th century. There's a, a chapter on the interwar period. Uh, there's a chapter of the post-war period. There's a chapter of the post-Cold War uh, period. And then there is a post 9-11. Uh, a chapter in post 9-11. So you have in each of these periods where there are claims that something significant happened, that certain kind of transformations occurred, so mainstream claims, um, Tina kind of accentuates how basically, even though the doctrines may shift, um, uh, there is pattern-wise uh, the same thing uh, to be uh, analyzed. However, uh, if you look more closely, even at those just focusing on some, so there are different types of critiques one might have. One might be about selection bias. What are the things that are actually being looked at here and why aren't there other things uh, focused on that might be more illuminating for a general history of international law? I don't want to go there. I just don't, don't want to criticize the, the chosen materials. I, even if we just focus on those materials, I think the, the claim isn't borne out. So instead, what I think, and I'll just present the counter thesis here, uh, what one sees is indeed an oscillation, uh, but it, but the pattern, the pattern of argumentation and the internal oscillation shifts in an important and significant way, and in a way, in an important and significant way, which in the end appears to, I think, validate quite conventional mainstream progress narratives. And so here is uh, what I think we can observe. First, I don't think contrary to what uh, Tina. Uh, suggests that the logic of biology or any other kinds of essentialisms really lasts through um, uh, uh, the interwar uh, period. There is still, um, uh, um, I think, an oscillation between positions which um, uh, claim that the grounds for structure for having inequality and asymmetry are deeper and those that insist it's just more shallow. But I think the general story is one uh, where biology disappears, essentialism disappears, um, and instead we have a different oscillation. So just make it simple to focus from the, to, to kind of come to the end. Um, uh, what we have in the end uh, is an oscillation between a logic of improvement um, and uh, improvement understood as some kind of uh, structural development and a logic of failed policy and bad regimes. Um, uh, um, so with other words, the grounds, the grounds that justify asymmetries. Uh, originally, this was the world of civilization when there was actually still talk of civilization. The idea was some states are civilized, some are not yet or not fully, and therefore there are certain asymmetries, certain hierarchies that are justified, certain extraterritorial jurisdiction that can be exercised, etc. Uh, and the grounds were ultimately oscillating between genuine biology, racist priority, racist supremacy of the European white race um, uh, on the one hand, and ideas of culture uh, and of, of something that can in principle develop over time, even though it will take a lot of time and a lot of effort, uh, et cetera. So that's how it started off. Um, how it ends, once we move to, I'll just take one example, to use the doctrine that uh, Tina focuses on and that began to play a, world, a significant role in the post 9-11 world, uh, unable and unwilling. Uh, so the doctrine that it was a state was authorized to practice self-defense against terrorists, which meant that if these, if these terrorists were located on another territory of another sovereign state, uh, if that state was unable and unwilling uh, to uh, fight terrorism effectively and prosecute the relevant terrorists and shut down terrorist operations, if a state was unable and unwilling to do that, then it was a the right. It was part of the right of self-defense of the injured state, the state that was subject to our terrorist attacks, to actually extraterritorial. Uh, the uh, um, kind of use force on the territory of that other sovereign state without the, the consent of that state. Now, I think that's a not a doctrine of international law. Uh, it was just a claim made by American governments at first um, and is basically accepted by very few outside of that context. But let's ignore that too. Let's just say it's a pattern of argumentation that plays a role, at least in the Northern context, when we discuss international law. But unable and unwilling, it refers to 
unwilling refers to policy choices. The idea is there is a regime in place in that other jurisdiction, which is not engaging in the appropriate anti-terrorist policies. That can be changed at will. That's really superficial. All we need is a change of policy of the respective government, or perhaps at, at most a change of government. Um, um, that's not deep at all. That's neither. It doesn't require development, and certainly not biology. This is kind of this is a very superficial deficiency for justifying uh, asymmetries. Um, so that's kind of the on the one pole, and the other pole is you know un, unable means there is something still structurally, and this and here the language of failed states of plays a role. There is something structurally still going on, which makes that state incapable, irrespective of the will of those who happen to be governing, uh, of fulfilling its duties under international law to comply with the respective terrorist conventions and general principles of law applying to fighting terrorism. Um, um, and so, so that's kind of the logic of, there we have the logic, the old logic of improvement, but not the logic of biology. Um, so what we have in contemporary times is we have still we still have an oscillation, we still have asymmetries, um, but those the shift that has occurred is um, the oscillation used to be between the logic of biology and logic of improvement to take Tina's uh, language, and now it's, it's an oscillation between the language of improvement, the language of the logic of improvement as a deep structural improvement, and the language of policy and mere will. That's the oscillation. Uh, I think that characterize the present. And that means that the grounds for justifying asymmetries um, have become more tenuous and more temporal, no more transient. Um, uh, um, and that's, I'm not saying, you know, that makes it a great world to live in and everything is fine and hunky dory, uh, but that's an important structural shift uh, that I think is worthy to draw attention to. So that's, uh, that's, so that's a, a first point. Um, and, and arguably, and it's an important shift to draw attention to because it does seem to be quite far removed from the original colonial, uh, con uh, the original colonial context in the context of empire. And um, so we have to be, and here's another thing to be careful of. There's an implicit normative assumption that the very existence of uh, the justification of asymmetries under any circumstances between different actors is in and of itself potentially something that's part of the pattern of argumentation connected to empire uh, and to colonialism, and that uh, there is no progressive uh, account one could give. Um, there's no, no progressive account. Um, or there's no, no such thing as justified, um, uh, uh, justified um, temporal um, uh, asymmetries of, of that kind. It, it doesn't, it kind of automatically, automatically insists that this is a continuation of a, a pattern uh, of argumentation connected to uh, empire uh, and colonialism. And instead of asking this or keeping open, open mind whether there, uh, whether there might not be a different type uh, of account uh, for these types uh, of asymmetries, once the grounds shift, once the grounds for those asymmetries change. So now, the second core claim of the thesis so is that whatever changes we see, both the continuities that we see, but also the changes uh, within those continuities, we should understand as um, um, as modern as, as as modern capitalism working itself out and um, and changing its demands under different uh, circumstances and different in different contexts. And I find what the thesis itself presents in that regard as not, not really uh, bearing that out. I mean, normally when we think about, and so of course, in some sense, this is now not a very productive remark. Uh, I'm not a Marxist. I think Marxist has, a, has an awful history of philosophy. It's really, really bad um, and really um, uh, uh, problematic as an account of how things um, uh, move. So the, this kind of monocausal focus on um, economic um, uh, productions economic production, uh, I think, is a, is a deep problem. That doesn't mean that there isn't always something to be said about those things, but um, economic, but alternative, I, alternative accounts of, of, of change that focus on, say, interests of great powers um, and great power competition, or that focuses on ideological conflict of various kinds as an independent variable. Uh, all of those things, I think, complement one another. Uh, and it, it's, it's an interesting question to ask, 
when we see a shift occurring with regard to doctrine or institutions, et cetera, what is actually doing the work there? Is it, is it a shift in ideology? Uh, how is that shift in ideology connected to power competition? How is it connected to uh, econ forms of economic production? Um, but, to, but there's something reductive um, to kind of make everything about capitalism and to try to connect it all um, to um, and I think in this, and, and I think the book nicely illustrates uh, this because there's actually very little um, in the book um, that um, over accentuates and emphasizes the link to capitalist modernity all that much. In that sense, I thought the title "Civilization: Capitalism as Civilization" is deeply misguiding because capitalism doesn't feature very much in the book. Instead, what we have is in each of these in each of these chapters, uh, Tina. Uh, briefly states, and really there's, there's, it's not very much typically, how a particular shift um, is somehow plausibly also related um, to aspects of modern capitalism. So, for example, um, in, the, in the story of Southwest Africa, the Namibia story about the advisory opinion of the, uh, when in the late, in the early 1970s, the ICJ um, addresses questions of mandate, uh, et cetera, and, and brings up the, and, and has a new framework uh, for um, thinking about hierarchies using human rights. Um, Tina rightly says, well, when, the, the, when now the, the ICJ uh, focuses on human rights, what the, what the court does not focus on is the underlying uh, social economic grounds for the misery um, in, uh, in, uh, that the large parts of the Namibian populations uh, is in. So it doesn't go to the root uh, causes. I think that's true. It's just a true analysis. Um, but uh, to, to make those observations, how a certain particular shift in doctrinal structure um, is compatible with um, uh, uh, spreads uh, of, or kind of an ignorance or a hiding of certain type of social economic frame is, is very different from um, kind of giving an account that shows that the primary driver for a certain shift uh, or uh, uh, is in fact a, a change in, uh, of social economic production, et cetera. So the core point, and I'll make the core point in each of these, these little, in each of these chapters, uh, modern capitalism comes in um, as something uh, which is perfectly compatible with uh, modern uh, capitalism. None of these evolutionary, uh, none of the evolutions that are described here uh, are directed against modern capitalism, uh, and they have some kind of an enabling potential to some extent in some often quite peripheral way. Um, so, for example, to, to show how peripheral it can sometimes be, in the case of the Iraq war, Tina rightly points out that the policies adopted by the American interim authorities, provisional authorities governing uh, Iraq, uh, they were contrary to the laws of occupation. Uh, they were engaging in uh, a, re a restructuring uh, of the Iraqi, Iraqi policies uh, in a neoliberal, uh, under a neoliberal guise. So they were engaged in neoliberal economic policies. Uh, in violation of the laws of occupation, arguably. Um, that's true. Um, but how exactly is that fact linked? I'll I'm sorry. You can't. Yes, um, uh, how exactly is that fact linked um, uh, to uh, the fact that the United States fights a war of aggression, uh, fights the war that it fights, um, uh, um, and uh, adopts the doctrines, the justificatory doctrines um, uh, that it does. Um, and the link there is arguably, a, you know, it's, it's a highly attenuated, highly disputed one, and arguably a, an attenuated one. So the core claim is the account that is provided does not, bore, not, not bear out the centrality uh, of modern capitalist as a of modern capitalism as a varial explaining the shifts of doctrinal structure that we see. So both the structure is different from the one that Tina says it is. It's not a perpetuation, perpetual uh, oscillation between logic of biology and logic of improvement. There is, in fact, an interesting shift in, 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 in uh, the oscillation that occurs. It's, it's instead, later on, it becomes uh, an oscillation between the logic of structural improvement and a logic of policy shifts, of, of policy um, criticism. 
Uh, and secondly, the link to capitalism uh, is significantly more attenuated um, uh, than at least the title and the core thesis suggests. Great. Uh, thank you, Matthias. And it's your turn, Fina, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you all three uh, for, of course, for taking the time uh, to read the book and to think about the book and to prepare these remarks, especially at the end of what uh, has been a very, very difficult year uh, for a lot of people. And also uh, many thanks uh, to the organizers uh, of ICON for inviting me and for orchestrating this event. Uh, before I proceed, I also want to acknowledge as it's fit and proper um, that I'm, I'm zooming in from Canberra and Canberra has been for thousands and thousands of years, the country of the Nagurgo and Gambri people. And I want to acknowledge that sovereignty over these lands has never been lawfully ceded. Um, on that note, uh, these were obviously three extremely rich um, contributions and sets of thoughts. So I think I will have to inevitably be somewhat uh, selective in addressing them. Um, so I, I will start from Fabia's uh, comments uh, and then because I think there I have some concrete things to say and then maybe I'll, I'll move to higher theory. Um, so Fabia, thank you very much. Um, I'll start uh, and it's also really nice to have this conversation as you said also at the tail of sharing an office for so many years uh, in Melbourne and having uh, these discussions um, in real time. Um, so the, I understood you having two questions. The first was, what is the political but also intellectual value of having a structural up type of argument about international law? And the second being much more tactical about the types of arguments that people should or shouldn't um, advance when they um, when they engage in political struggle. I think I'll start from the latter. So I have a historical argument and I have a broader political or jurisprudential argument. My historical argument is that I very much doubt that um, historically it has been, I don't know, the oppressed that have been using the language of civilization, both in international law and domestically. In fact, one of the things I did try to show in a fragmented way, but I think I did to an extent in chapter two, is actually the way in which the discourse of civilization was actually mobilized very, very intensely and very, very successfully to a certain extent against all sorts of subalterns in the global south, not by imperial powers, but by local ruling classes, right? Um, so suddenly, um, people in the north of then so-called Siam become uncivilized. Why? Because basically they don't want their lands to be used for like, timber, basically, to produce timber. And I have the sense, I, I mean, obviously, I'm much more knowledgeable about Brazil than you are, but, but my very impressionistic sense is that civilization type arguments that some people are not productive enough, and therefore they are not um, they should not be afforded certain types of rights, especially property rights, um, or especially collective property rights over land, is not the argument uh, of indigenous people, it's the uh, people's, it's the argument uh, of the Bolsonaro government and all these types of arguments, right? So I don't think I'm taking anything out, um, in, especially intensely, from the oppressed, provided, of course, that we don't buy the self-positioning of third world, like developing or whatever we want to call it now, elites, um, including lawyers, as the oppressed, right? Uh, I, I don't buy that. I don't think Calvo uh, was particularly oppressed. I think the way Calvo used international legal argumentation was anti-imperial in certain respects, very limited respects, but at the same time, the way Calvo wrote about indigenous peoples in Latin America would make like Lorimer blush, right? So that would be the one thing. But I think the point remains, right? Um, and I think 
let's say about usages of human rights in the struggle, I don't think to begin with that all usages of human rights are necessarily usages of the standard of civilization. Because I, I mean, I've said, I'm interested about argumentative patterns, not words. And I think you can argue human rights and people have argued human rights in a way that is extremely civilizational. And people have also argued human rights in ways that are not. And I suspect the, the case you're talking about might be a case that you don't. Even, let's say that even this argument doesn't persuade you. I think there is a third argument that is, there is a difference between striving to understand both from a political but also even from a sociological perspective the ways the oppressed argue their cases in endorsing these ways or saying that therefore these ways must be correct right in the sense that like historically and again latin america would be an example also the oppressed have used religion to argue uh, for their rights and for their livelihoods, that doesn't compel me to become a Catholic. I think it's interesting. I think it's something that we should be attentive to and understand why people do it. I don't think there is any compulsion there to therefore adopt it, partly because I think also the oppressed, to say the oppressed means nothing, right? People use extremely different argumentative strategies in extremely different times and also my again i'm not talking about brazil but like my sense from greece for example is usually the people engaged in the struggle are also very like tactical and very cynical in these invocations right they know what are the limits and they know um what the bargains are but generally speaking I, I don't think that civilization as an argumentative pattern has predominantly been an argumentative um choice of those who are actually um oppressed provided that we be don't believe the rules that third world elites are actually um oppressed so that would be um the answer to the one um so what are the politics of the book and what are the politics especially of adopting a structuralist approach? The disciplinary politics of the book, uh, which is slightly different to the real politics of the book, is um, that I don't think there is any reason to jettison uh, uh, what Tanzel said is, I think, an essentially correct observation about law, which is indeterminacy, in order to say that law can, international law, let's say, can be complicit to domination and exploitation. And I think this is a slight tendency of critical work, and I'm using the word broadly, in international law that distinguish it from traditional CLS, there is, I feel, a certain reification um, of law as rules, because we have felt, and I think we were mistaken, we have felt that this is the only way that therefore we can critique or even criticize law. And I don't think that's true. And that, that in the terms of jurisprudential politics, that's what I tried to show. I tried to show that we can hold on to the idea of structure indeterminacy, not unstructured indeterminacy, not like anything goes indeterminacy, and nevertheless say that international law's bias manifests in the way in which it is indeterminate. It doesn't, you don't need to believe that law is rules in order to say that it does things in the world, good or bad things, anything. So that would be my, my disciplinary politics intervention. Um, my real life um, politics intervention is obviously, um, I am very worried um, about these uh, silly um, discussions within uh, the left in the Anglo world about it is class. No, 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 it is race. No, 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 it is class. No, 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 it's gender. Um, and in a sense, I tried to show, um, of course, in a, not in a class race um, diet, but in a, in a slightly broader diet, that this is a slightly misplaced uh, discussion that I think really misunderstands um, some core um, 
in sides, not only of, of Marxist theories of, theories of imperialism, but I would say also of non-Marxist theories of imperialism about um, the potential uh, of capitalism to produce both homogenization and certification at the same time. So that was, that was the broader um, anxiety that I had um, when writing the book, that you can hold on to ideas of race and gender as both grounds of oppression, but material grounds of oppression, but also as an important argumentative tropes in international law, but at the same time without devolving into a very superficial identity politics kind of idea and still have a critique of political economy. That was um, that was my concern was when I was writing it. And this is also why um, it's really different from the PhD. The PhD was much more, oh, no, 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 this is all about capitalist modernity. So that I think, um, if I didn't respond to something, I'm happy to return to that later. Uh, Tanzil, uh, thank you so much. And I'm actually really looking forward to reading that book review you referred to. Please send it to me. Um, so, and, and it's really interesting to hear that this could have some purchase uh, for people outside um, international law. And I, I was really interested to hear your, your story about post-colonial constitution making, um, partly because um, it didn't end up being much um, in the book as such, um, but ideas um, of, um, new constitutionalism, uh, you know, uh, Jill's um, framework in the 90s of like, um, were actually very, very formative. I didn't, I, I chose not to use the word, the, the language of constitutionalism. I, I don't, I'm not sure what it does to the argument, but it was really, really, uh, that, that's the sort of stuff I was reading. So like kind of Gramscian, I uh, was the stuff I was reading throughout um, the PhD. So it's interesting to see that you have picked it up. And also the other thing, because also I think she's in, she's in the audience, my former colleague, Anna Saunders, um, has written not in the um, Register of Civilization, but she has written about constitution making um, in Japan after the war. Second World word within basically she's not necessarily using the same words, but I think she has very very similar concerns about um, reproduction of particular forms of political economy, and I'm happy to give you uh, the reference to that. What is my understanding? So I think you did a fantastic job also in summarizing uh, different understandings um, of law in Marxism, and. I think I have already started responding to your question for responding to Fabia, which is one of the way I wanted to come into this debate was by saying, not only you can, I think we should have a Marxist understanding of law that doesn't refine law, law into rules. I feel this is an incredible, uh, like undoing uh, of a hundred years of critical and American legal realism and then CLS that I don't feel there is any need to do. And if anything, and I think I cited very early um, in the intro, but I don't engage much. I'm extremely interested, um, and I think I've talked to you uh, about that, um, in the fact that Duncan Kennedy in the structure of the Blackstone's commentary, which is a very structuralist piece, at the same time, he, he says that this is a neo-Marxist uh, piece. And he never quite explains why, but I think that is an insight worth returning to. And I think, so I do believe that law is relatively autonomous, I also believe that law is constitutive, but in a very particular way, in the sense that I think law is necessary, but not sufficient for the construction of, let's say, political economic categories such as property. And I think this has to be the difference between a Marxist approach to the constitutive role of law than, let's say, a left law and political economy in the sense that I don't think have things happen in the world because law wills them into happening. And I also think in order to understand how this concept, let's say I'm sticking with property emerge, law is absolutely one aspect of it. But you know, 
like private ordering is another, right? Administrative practices on the ground is a third. Like the way people resist um, property norms inflicted upon us, it's also like constitutive to how property is. So I don't think that like um, private law cases construct property in its entirety. So I do think it's constitutive, but I don't think it's it constitutes political economy in its entirety. Um, so that I think, and I think I might um, leave it there because oh, I'm actually, I've run terribly late and I have to respond uh, to Matthias. Thank you so much. I think I'll put, when the soft, the paperback comes out, I think the a pleasure of shorts should definitely feature um, on the cover. Um, so, I think you had two main challenges. The first was about what you saw as a change in structure of the oscillation, that the oscillation exists, but the two poles have changed. I think, I think we, we, we totally disagree about that. And I think we totally disagree about that for two reasons. I don't think um, the second pole has become as superficial, let's say, or are as malleable as bad policy. And I think that's true for, for two reasons. First, because let's, let's take the unwilling or unable doctrine, right? This change of policy, I think, is, would require much more than just a change of policy, as in, I think today to comply with whatever the US, let's say, or the hegemonic idea of counterterrorism is, this requires a huge reconfiguration of the state. It requires resources going from one place to another. It requires states signing up to train and equip projects. And in fact, when Ashley Dick says, um, Georgia is not unwilling, the evidence she gives is that she, Georgia signed up for a US trained and equipped problem, a program. Um, I think it requires a certain very deep, given if, if, you, if we see after 9-11, how fundamentally the budget of the US changes to accommodate the war on terror, and even the budget of Pakistan changes fundamentally to accommodate war on terror. Things like giving also things like in domestic constitutional administrative law, giving different sorts of powers to the police or giving different sorts of powers to the army. This doesn't seem to me like, oh, should the tax rate be 12 or 13%? To me, that seems like a very fundamental um, battle about how we organize um, resources and how we organize violence and how we organize internal distribution of power amongst um, uh, domestic uh, constitutional actors, let's say, right? So that doesn't seem small to me. The second thing, and I use this example when I teach use of force, is in 2019, an Australian uh, neo-Nazi basically travels to New Zealand where in Christchurch murdered, a, like, I don't remember the number of people, but tens of people in a mosque. And when I teach use of force, I'm asking my students if New Zealand can therefore, and this person came from a part of New South Wales that is known to be a hub of far right and Nazi and like political organization in Australia. It's a well-known place. It's full of like neo-Nazis and far right white supremacists. And I ask my students, is New Zealand entitled to start droning people in NSW? Because that was terrorism, right? That was terrorism. And Australia isn't willing or unable to do anything about it. These people are still there. Nothing is happening to them. And everybody's laughing. And everybody's laughing because we know that this is not going to be used against Australia. And when I ask my students, you know, the biggest number um, of foreign fighters in Syria came from Belgium. Is Syria entitled to bomb Belgium, because Belgium isn't willing or unable to stop these people, everybody's laughing because we know this is not going to happen in Belgium. Point being, and this is where I stop laughing, um, to say that uh, race uh, is not a structuring force in the way use of force uh, is articulated in international law, I think 
I, I can't see how this is true. And of course, and we agree on that, it's not used with the degree of explicitness that was used in 1905. But I think when, again, Ashley Dick says, well, you know, it's very difficult to say who is unwilling or unable, but there are certain states that are well known to have lost control over their territory. That seems to me like a dog whistling that is so loud that everyone um, can hear it. Uh, so I think I'll stop here because I have run terribly over time and I'm sure we can come back to some of these points.